Hello. This is really fun having live uh, technical difficulties, having folks wait for us. Sorry about that. Um, so we are here. We are live in Project Land with a very special event today called Napoleon in Project Land. So if you've been with us before, welcome back. We love Project Land and we love giving you the chance to explore it with us and with our gurus who have lots and lots of experience in surviving the wild world of projects that we like to call Project Land. Um, so if you are out there, uh, we'd love to know where you are. So in the comments, please let us know where you are. And I will also comment that I am in Florida today. And our guest is sitting in Philadelphia. So where are you? Where are you dialing in from? Let us know. Let us know. And uh, Ricardo is our producer. Thank you, Ricardo, is in Venezuela. And he was calmly helping us through our technical difficulties earlier while I was trying hard not to freak out. So um, next slide, please, Jerry. All right, so new to Project Land. If you are new to Project Land, don't worry, you're in the right place. So I call it Project Land because I have discovered that a lot of people have day jobs and then they also get asked to do projects. A lot of people are in operations or business as usual jobs and then they are also asked to join projects. And the world of operations or business usual has very different rules than the world of projects. And so we call it something different. We call it project land to help people understand that it is different. There are different roles and rules. So if you're new to Project Land, welcome. We love newbies. We love helping people navigate the wild world of projects in a hopefully less stressful way than they would without a little bit of guidance. Uh, if you've ever taken a trip before to a place that you don't know anything about, a lot of times you might do a little research, talk to some people who have been there before, and that's what we like to do for you. We like to help you understand this wild world of projects so that you can succeed in it. And also, if you're back, if you have joined us in Project Land before, we'd like to welcome you back. Thanks for coming on back. Um, this is a really special show, and I'm really excited to share with you. Uh, we were prepping, prepping, prepping for this. And uh, Jerry Manis, our best-selling author and the author of Napoleon in project management, leadership lessons that are timeless is joining us today. But first, I just want to share a little bit about me. If you're new to the Project Guru Academy or PMO Training, Dot com, um, then hi, my name is Dawn and I'm PMP certified. I've also helped people become PMP certified as do many of our gurus who are PMP certification gurus. So if you're looking for that, let us know. We can help you navigate that wild world as well. Uh, back in 2009, I, I went rogue. I went independent and I've not looked back. Um, I was a Fortune 500 leader where actually our, I met our guest today, way back when in Philadelphia in the early 2000s, when we were working not very far from Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. And uh, we've been friends ever since. And I've certainly learned so much over the years from him. And today you will too. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to Jerry Manis. He is our project guru for today. He is the president of Project Guru Press. Stay tuned for that. We're going to be rolling that out in 2024. And he is an internationally best-selling author, speaker, consultant, and a dear friend of mine who puts up with me at Phillies games, evidenced by uh, some photos on Instagram earlier this year, by the way. And uh, also, he's got some a whole bunch of books out all about Project Land, about leadership and helping folks succeed. Some of his books are used in universities today. Um, I personally never read business books by the pool. However, I read Napoleon on Project Management by the pool and loved it. So that should tell you something because I personally, much to my father's dismay, am not a history buff. So Jerry, come on up and tell us um, 
Are you a history buff? Thanks, Don. Uh, well, it's funny. History was probably my worst subject in school. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> but that's because all they talked about were dates and battles. And I was like, who cares? But it wasn't until I got older and more curious and started seeing quotes from Napoleon and and uh, you know, other leaders, I started getting curious. And uh, I started investigating the why. And that led me down a rabbit hole of some some 30 books of research. But uh, it, it was the why to me that mattered, and uh, rather than just memorizing dates and battles. And uh, so history can be interesting if yes. it's taught right. Yes, it can, which you, you know, it, it was so intriguing to read your book on Napoleon on project management, because obviously I love project management, but I also, it was such a nice way to get introduced to one of the most interesting, at least I think, um, leaders in history and it turns out, I've learned from you, that his stuff is all actually very well documented. So we can learn so much more from him than, than we could some of the other leaders uh, back there. And so uh, for, for folks who might be seeing these little tiny icons of your books on the screen, can you just, I just want to make sure that we're sharing what they are. So we've got the 42 rules uh, for creating we, which you... yeah, that one that one I contributed eight chapters to it was a group of us that founded the Creating We Institute, and we wrote a book on uh, on uh, well rules for creating we, <laughs> creating a sense of we in organizations, and it was interesting seeing our different perspectives. And uh, Angela Ahrens, who was CEO of Burberry at the time, called it uh, today's greatest guide for team success. So that was a, a nice boon, I thought. So definitely check that out if you're interested in creating we. So the why is so important and that team spirit is so important today in getting stuff done in the workplace as well. And then managing the gray areas. What's that? Uh, my wife wanted me to write managing the gray hairs, but I chose managing the gray areas. Uh, it was funny. I had run a, a leadership workshop, a two-day workshop at the Constitution Center in Philadelphia with a colleague, Jerome Jewell. And we thought we had everything down. We were talking about the four P's of leadership. It was process and principles and people. And frankly, I forget the other P. But <laughs> but uh, it, it, one of the things we found out is we had a flip chart. And we had the audience was from all walks of life, from manufacturing, healthcare, military intelligence, and so on. And with all these universal principles that we were talking about, um, there were a lot of gray areas or a lot of things that said, well, it works here, but it doesn't work here. Or what if this is the case? So uh, as we captured them, I thought, well, that's going to be my next book. And it was about the, the seven common uh, gray areas that most leaders face. And uh, so that was that was fun investigating that on that one. So I would imagine that a lot of that, you know, the gray. So people have gray hair, some of us, as we work, <laughs> work through Project Land uh, and earn them, I think. Um, I personally go to the salon and get them eliminated now, but they're 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 in there. And um and and so I feel like the people part and a lot of my folks that I work with who are technical people, engineers, IT people, et cetera, they say the people part of project management is the hardest. And so I feel like managing the gray areas would be a great help for anybody that feels that way. Yeah, yeah, it gets into centralization versus decentralization and where do you draw the line between rigorous process and flexibility and freedom and you know, th you know things like that where they can, there can be gray areas. Cool. And so speaking of, um, there, <laughs> we'll skip over the, the next one for a second because that gets us back to history, but the Resource Management and Capacity Planning Handbook. So resource management is so, so hard in organizations where there people are assigned to everything especially and i see that so often where people are not only on projects they're also re required to do day jobs and so forth like i talked about earlier so is that what the resource management and capacity planning handbook is supposed to help with yeah absolutely you could you could have the best uh, project execution in the world and the best planning and you could even have portfolio management where you're choosing the right projects but if you haven't managed the resources and, and assessed your capacity to get it done, then your portfolio isn't feasible and all the, the great work you're doing on the project is going to suffer. And often that's why projects are late, uh, where, where there's issues with projects, people are over, overworked, overburdened. And so resource planning, I think, is a crucial part of the process that often gets overlooked. 
That makes sense. That makes sense. And it's complicated. So some people yeah. like to avoid the complex and that makes sense. Um, so finally you got into, even though you weren't a history buff to begin with, like me, you got into yeah. the Roman empire. Well, it was sort of like a, a chain. I, I was reading books on marketing and I saw, I think it was crossing the chasm and it had quotes from Napoleon, from not Napoleon, from Patton. So then I saw it was from a book called Patton on Leadership by Alan Axelrod, which I read and devoured and loved it. But then I saw Patton kept quoting Napoleon. So I thought, well, that that you know, was interesting. And they weren't the kind of quotes that I would have expected from Napoleon. So I did a little digging and I found to my surprise, there was a lot of what was probably propaganda. <laughs> but as we, I dug in deeper, I thought there was a lot there to learn. Uh, that's when I started writing articles. And then I saw well, articles come and go. I had so much material, I might as well write a book. Uh, but Napoleon was inspired by the Romans. So that seemed to be the natural next step. <laughs> to say, well, maybe, maybe one day I'll do something on the ancient Chinese. But <laughs> in the meantime, uh, the, the logical next step seemed to investigate what he found so effective about the Roman Empire. And of course, there are lots of uh, high points and low points there. Yeah, I try to cover a thousand years of history in 200 pages. <laughs> amazing. And so let's get into it. So today's episode, we were working on some questions that folks might ask about Napoleon. And first of all, why Napoleon? Well, first of all, you might have heard that there's a movie out. So we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but our learning objectives for today, what Jerry's going to do is, this is going to be a little different format than you may have seen before from us. He has control of the screen. So usually I have control. Like of Napoleon, I have control. Yes, <laughs> Jerry has, it's so fitting for us to do it that way. Um, so we are, I'm going to chime in as opposed to asking the questions and really leading us through it because Jerry has prepared, which is so amazing and I'm so grateful, Jerry, for all the work you did to prepare for this, um, has prepared a portion of his keynote that he's done in organizations around the world um, for us. And so he's gonna go through that and you're gonna learn so, so much. Pro Jerry has probably forgotten more about Napoleon than any of us, <laughs> at least me, uh, will ever care to know. So he's gonna take us through a whole lot of it and he's going to guide us through the answers to these questions. Like, what can Napoleon teach us about the art and science of project management and leadership? And why Napoleon? Why do we want to learn from Napoleon? What research record keeping and organization methods did Napoleon use that I can apply to my projects for better results? We want you to have practical information that you can use on the job and maybe feel a little inspired even by this historical figure. How can Napoleon help me better understand the dynamic between project management and strategic leadership? I can't wait for the answers to that part because a lot of people miss the linkage between strategy and project leadership and projects are usually how you execute your strategy. So um, that's gonna be a really fun answer to that question that he'll take us through. And then principles and We've got in his book, six winning principles, not seven, not five, six, right, Jerry? <laughs> That's right. I, I had that debate with the publisher. <laughs> yeah. Like, Jerry, can you just make it seven? No. Yeah, that's what they said. They said odd numbers sell better. I said, well, there's six. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's right. I love it. Yeah. So stand, stand your ground, lesson number one. <laughs> So, um, so the the principles that he's going to share today around uh, Napoleon's imp it, guide for helping you be a project manager, a better project manager and leader. So you maybe you're not coming as a project manager, maybe you're a leader in an organization. That's great too. You're gonna learn a lot today. And how can I learn, how can we all learn to adopt Napoleon's successful traits while avoiding his negative ones that could lead to our own Waterloo-esque downfall. So we don't want that. Um, and of course, if you have questions, please uh, add them in the comments anytime you like, and we'll try to get to them. And if we can't get to them in the live show, we'll double back and we'll seek to get to them uh, right afterwards. So with that, um, as you can see here, we've got our tiger in the upper right-hand corner that Jerry found all dressed up like Napoleon and why the tiger? Well, our logo is a tiger. And why is our logo a tiger? Because the tiger is our animal avatar for the project manager, not quite the king or queen of the jungle, 
but awfully close. Our animal avatar for the sponsor of projects is the lion, and uh, which is the king or queen of the jungle. And so uh, we use the tiger a lot. Uh, I have a book coming out soon, which Jerry is helping me with, all about Meet the Players in Project Land, where we're going to reveal all the animal avatar avatars and how to get your people lined up for your project in the beginning. So stay tuned for that. Um, and please stay tuned to the end for how you can get the takeaway, which is a curated uh, document of Napoleon quotes that Jerry and P Jerry put together. So if you love the quote, some of the quotes you see, we have a whole document of curated Napoleon quotes for you. And it's organized by category as well. So check that out. Um, stay to the end to get the link where you can get your very own um, takeaway document. So with that, let's take it away, Jerry. Sure. Okay. So like Dawn said, you may have heard there's a movie out uh, on Napoleon. And as you can see from the, the poster here, he came from nothing. He conquered everything. Well, we're not going to learn how to conquer everything today, but hopefully we can, we probably won't even learn how to conquer project land, but we can survive it. And I think some of these lessons will, will help there. And we'll, we'll talk more about the real Napoleon. Now, how do I know the real Napoleon? Well, I didn't, I was a little too young then, but, uh, the, uh, but there some 30 books later, you really start to get to get a feel for what his traits were and, and the way he operated. So, uh, the movie was close, but there were some nuances, and we'll point those out. You also might have heard that despite standards and tools, most projects fail. Now, uh, often it's because there's not enough horsepower, like our poor little horse up here. Uh, and sometimes that can be an overabundance of scope or trying to do too much uh, with too little. Um, and uh, also, uh, sometimes it's a lack of planning, like these guys at the railroad tracks that don't meet. Uh, but more often than not, it's a lack of communication. And uh, as uh, Dawn always uh, talks about, uh, project management is uh, really a key success behind projects is uh, communication. Now, some common challenges, uh, trying to make people do things that they don't want to do or trying to address uh, where people are rowing in different directions and trying to get them all rowing in the same direction, especially stakeholders, and trying to make decisions uh, without really having uh, effective data. So we're trying to operate with blinders on. And uh, so this often happens with projects where you're not close enough to the, the customer, the data, and we're gonna see some uh, ways to resolve all that. So we search for something new, whether it's tools or methods, uh, various answers or silver bullets. And it's not all that easy because there's a lot of challenges here. Uh, now, Harry Truman had a quote I always liked. He said, there's nothing new in this world except the history you do not know. And at this point, you're probably like Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, where he says, uh, eventually you do plan on talking about Napoleon in this Napoleon presentation, right? Huh? Anyway, let's talk about Napoleon. And notice, if, for those who saw the movie, notice he looks a little younger and thinner here. In his early days, he was only 22. After all, he died at 51. Uh, so he was pretty young when he died. And in, in the film, he looks like he's in his mid to late 50s uh, early on. <laughs> so it's, that's one of the little nuances about the film. But at any rate, I still recommend it, by the way. But um, Napoleon was 5'7". Uh, he was average height at the time, uh, which a lot of people, a lot of that was propaganda. They try to make Napoleon out to be like the little mouse that roared, so to speak. Uh, also, if he had any kind of an accent, it was an Italian accent because he was Corsican. Uh, when he was born, there was a civil war, and that's when Corsica changed hands to France, but uh, he grew up Italian, basically. Um, it'll cost you an arm and a leg. Uh, that's a saying that many of you have probably have heard, but you may not have realized is uh, a lot of that was because artists, when they were painting uh, figures, uh, they would usually avoid painting appendages like arms and legs because it took longer and it would cost more and things like that. So that's where that expression came from. So Napoleon, uh, a lot of people think he always walked around with his hand in his jacket. Uh, well, number one, that was just common at the time. The dignitaries, it was considered a dignified pose, but also because uh, I think it was probably influenced by the artists uh, the, and, and to save time and money and things like that. So it also had a practical example. And as you'll see, if you look at old pictures, probably George Washington, and you'll see some other photos here, uh, not photos, but paintings of other people uh, similarly. Now, what was Napoleon all about? What was his goal? What was he trying to achieve? 
he was trying to achieve what he called a federation of countries, which in essence is the European Union. He was just 200 years too early. Uh, his goal was to end hereditary monarchy, which you can imagine probably upset England and Russia a little bit. So, and that was what caused a lot of the problems. So it was really a clash of ideals that really uh, was happening around that time. Now, by the way, we talk about 5'7". Uh, other people who are 5'7", you can look at the list here, uh, you know, like Tom Cruise and Robert Downey Jr. and so on. So uh, it's, it's not even outrageous today, but at the time it was considered average height. So our first uh, question on our list of things to answer here is why Napoleon? Well, one is Napoleon had unparalleled accomplishments. And we're going to get, go through a quick list of, uh, of his resume. Uh, and you'll see he had really unparalleled accomplishments. And I always look for somebody that's accomplished great things, even if they failed in the end. But I look at the people who have accomplished great things and think, what can we learn from them? Uh, you know, what can we emulate and what can we watch out for? Uh, but uh, so it's, it's worth a study. And you'll see there was unparalleled accomplishments that we can learn from. Uh, he had a legendary organizational ability, and you'll see that too. He's, you know, primarily known by the the masses as a, a general or as, as you know on the battlefield. Many of his accomplishments, maybe even most of them, were not on the battlefield. Um, also, he had many principles, and it's probably better documented than anybody else in history because they were documented by him. Number one, when he wrote his memoirs, he listed all of his principles. But they were written by his, his first personal secretary and soldiers that worked for him and enemies. And it's, it's from all different perspectives. So it's, he's documented from 360 degrees. Now, why Napoleon and project management? Like, why isn't it just Napoleon on leadership? Um, well, the short answer is the publisher thought project management was an underserved market. Uh, so they thought that that would be a good focus. But that's besides the point. Uh, project management is really about overcoming challenges to achieve objectives. I mean, it's in essence what it's about. Uh, it's about planning and leading people and managing risks and understanding the terrain that you're dealing with. And as you'll see, Napoleon excelled at all of this. Now, we're gonna take a quick look at some of his accomplishments as an administrator, as a builder, uh, and as a leader. And you'll see that there's really unparalleled accomplishments that we could learn from. For one, he fought over 50 battles, led over 50 battles, 61 to be precise, and uh, over well over 90% of them were defensive in nature and the others were strategic. Um, and so you know, that's what a lot of people don't realize is in a lot of cases, they were be constantly being invaded, but he just kept winning. So we're gonna see uh, an example uh, in a little bit of a case study of a battle that actually has lessons that directly apply to business and project management. I'll be the first one to say not everything in the military applies to business, but these lessons I think do, and hopefully you'll agree. Um, he also had innovations in artillery and logistics. His troops invented the canning process. You know, we have today cans, you know, his troops invented that. Um, they had lighter artillery so they could travel further much faster than anybody would have expected for the time because they invented artillery that was lighter. He challenged them to come up with, with lighter artillery that could give him an advantage. He also had a very unique organizational structure, and we'll see a, a case study of that. Now, you look at this number, 3.5 million to 8,000. It's a pretty big uh, whopping amount <laughs> there. And that was actually the results of an election. And Napoleon was asked to be first consul for life because he was doing such a good job and he was so popular that they wanted to be first consul for life. But he did insist on having a constitutional republic. And he also insisted on elections that people would have to elect. And that was the results of the election. So clearly he was doing something right because he was overwhelmingly popular. Um, it wasn't even like half and half. It wasn't a debate. It was just he was overwhelmingly popular. He also created the civil code that's still in use today in France. Um, and actually one other place is still in use today in Louisiana. Because when the U.S. bought Louisiana from Napoleon, uh, they liked the civil code so much that they kept it, they adopted it, maybe minor tweaks. But the Napoleon civil code is still used today as part of state law in, in uh, Louisiana. At any rate, it guaranteed personal rights and property rights. Uh, at the time, all of these departments in France had their own civil codes, if any, and it was like spaghetti trying to read through all of them. And he insisted on having one simple code, and he, he ins installed a team to be able to create a civil code that would apply to everybody. 
and it was simple and it was you know used it ended up being used throughout France and it greatly simplified things. So first uh, lesson here, if Napoleon ruled project land, he would keep it simple. He would have simple reporting. Metrics would be simple. He wouldn't have people having like uh, 15 to 20 metrics. He would say, focus on the few key things that mattered. In his case, it was the price of wheat. He asked them to measure the, uh, the we'll, we'll see, see that in a minute, but he uh, used the price of wheat as an index. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, forms, he would have simple forms. Um, one of my pet peeves is a lot of people will create these forms and with so much information and 90% of it goes unused. So uh, a business case or a charter is often a good example. I had one client, it was a 12 page business case and they wondered why nobody was filling it out. And I suggested they get together with a team and co-create something and make sure everybody agrees on why every piece is needed. And they had much better luck. They ended up narrowing it down to two pages. Uh, approvals. In many cases, there's a long list of approvals. It's like the 12 trials of Hercules just trying to get something implemented, uh, when often simple checklists will do. If it works for hospitals and it works for airlines, it can work for a business. And same thing with processes. You know, People talk about scope creep. Often I talk about process creep because every department thinks theirs is the most important. And when you get everybody in a room to overview, you know, to go through the entire process, you can see where there's uh, opportunities for streamlining and redundancies and things like that. Uh, Napoleon also oversaw countless architectural projects. Uh, so needless to say, there are some project management lessons there. Um, his troops discovered the Rosetta Stone. His engineers, uh, they were part of his Egyptian campaign, and they discovered uh, it uh, while repairing a fort near the town of Rashid. Uh, Napoleon uh, invented the Legion of Honor medal that's still in use today. Uh, he said a soldier will fight long and hard for a bit of colored ribbon. Uh, even in business, there's simple things that we can do to, to make people strive for like a wall of success or some kind of reward systems or recognition systems that can really help. Uh, he instituted the Bank of France. Uh, he, at the time, uh, they had the option to bail out the banks, and he chose to establish a national bank. He said, when a government's dependent upon bankers for money, they, and not the leaders of the government, control the situation because the hand it gives is above the hand it takes. And I thought that was very astute, but at any rate, uh, he created the, the National Bank that's still in use today there. He created the school system. He said, of all of our institutions, public education is the most important. Everything depends on it, the present and the future. So he really valued education. He, in fact, he had his library follow him everywhere he went, his entire library. Uh, his, his troops, his chief uh, medic, uh, Dominique uh, Jean Larry, uh, and Napoleon um, came up with the concept of triage. And the idea is, uh, like they announced, uh, to afford the wounded speed of assistance. They created a, a unique ambulance system, but the idea was to prioritize in the order of the most need, even if people were fighting for the other side, which I thought was very, uh, very interesting. Uh, he also had to be a diplomat. I'm not going to get into detail on each of these, but he established uh, diplomatic relations in Italy. They still revere him to this day. In fact, their national flag wished to show uh, uh, unity between France and Italy, whereas before it was a different uh, flag in Italy. Uh, he uh, respected the culture in Egypt when he was there. Again, they discovered the Rosetta Stone. He wore the local garb. Uh, he instructed his troops to uh, respect the local cultures to the point where he insisted they all read the Quran en route to Egypt so that they understand their culture. Uh, he even established a peace with the church, even with England for a while, although that's a, a, a popular cartoonist at the time, a political cartoonist, did a cartoon of uh, uh, King George III looking at Napoleon in a little you know, holding him in a little locket or something like that. But uh, so they, they ended up breaking the treaty. And uh, so that was the end of that. Uh, he even established peace with the Russian Tsar. You know, Napoleon had a famous invasion of Russia, but he had a treaty of Tilsit where he established peace with the Russian Tsar. And they were actually friends. The Russian Tsar was only 21 year old, years old, and Napoleon was like a mentor to him. Uh, but eventually Napoleon had to invade Russia and he had the Dresden Conference in 1812, where he managed to get the, in all the crowns of Western Europe, all the leads of, of uh, Germany and uh, Poland and uh, you name it, uh, Italy, they were all part of his coalition. He had some 40 countries 
uh, of 600,000 strong when they invaded Russia. That was by, far from a solo effort. So you can imagine the diplomacy it would have taken. Uh, so he had to be a diplomat. So um, at Napoleon's height, when he was asked to establish an empire, which again, he insisted would be a constitutional republic, he was instituting architectural programs and school reforms and cultural reforms and legal and finance reforms, all in the middle of constant military threats. And he didn't have computers, he didn't have Excel. So you, you have to look at this, you know, right or wrong, egotist or not, it's a lot of accomplishments for somebody. And there must be lessons to learn from somebody that can manage to do all this with no computers or uh, or email or, or Excel or anything like that. Or cell phones. Or cell phones, right. <laughs> that's, that's right. No, hey, where are you? Do you remember those days when it was you really had to plan when you were going to meet somebody, like at a Phillies game, which where are you going to find each other without the phone working? It was, it took some extra planning. So I just can't, the, all this, this area that he covered without any technology, to me, it's just sort of mind blowing. It is. It is. In fact, there's a somewhere on online. Uh, I haven't. One of my presentations is a uh, a map of the failure at Waterloo, and it was, it was titled "My Kingdom for a Cell Phone." <laughs> if he had a cell phone, he wouldn't have lost at Waterloo. <laughs> That's for so sure. A, it makes a difference. So Napoleon says, "You think you have problems? Look at what I had to face, and I did all this during the equivalent of two U.S. presidential terms." So when you think about all the things that I showed, that all happened within the equivalent of two U.S. presidential terms. So Napoleon had to be an innovator and he had to be a diplomat and a motivator, an organizer, a strategist, an analyst, an influencer, a leader. Few people can do all of that, which is why I always encourage project managers, unless they have all of these skills, which is rare, uh, to assemble a core team for people that can make up for your, the gaps that, that you have. And so I think a core team is so important. Now, the Duke of Wellington, Napoleon's arch rival, who you can see also has his hand in his jacket, uh, said uh, in this age, in past ages, in any age, Napoleon, uh, he was asked the greatest general of his generation. He really had a deep respect for Napoleon, even though they were rivals. They, they kind of had a, a mutual respect for one another. It seems Napoleon was dynamite. Sorry, wrong Napoleon there. So, <laughs> so he was certainly an icon that lasted years. <laughs> confession, confession on the Napoleon Dynamite. I had the T-shirt, vote for Pedro. I really did. I really had, really had the T. Anyway, okay, keep going. That, that, that was popular at the time. Oh yeah, I had it. I love. I loved it. It was so silly. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for including that one. Sure, of course I had to. <laughs> so many mentioned Napoleon. That's a lot of people's first thought. Uh, Okay, so he did a lot. Uh, you get the point by now. But how? And luckily, there's a book by his first personal secretary called Napoleon, How He Did It. And that's awfully convenient. I was looking for books on how he did it, and I came across this one. I'm like, that's the one that'll help. <laughs> so, uh, there, were, there were a number of other books, too, that gave different perspectives. But, the, you know, all together, they were pretty much saying the same thing. So this takes us to the second question. What can we learn from Napoleon's methods? So we're going to take a quick look at his daily operations, his unique view of cost and value, and his time management routine. First, Napoleon was a master of organization. And again, as we said, he had no technology. This was actually from a painting of, I'm not kidding, it was a portfolio management meeting. They didn't call it that, but it was basically a meeting to review which projects to take on. And he insisted on always having the subject matter experts present and having the financial people present, because he said, if we have to make decisions on the fly, we don't want to have to wait till the next meeting or, or uh, you know, pause it. We want everybody with the answers to be present so we can make decisions right then and there. And uh, so I thought that was very interesting. And he had a, a whole schedule, a whole method for working. His operations is he had biweekly status reports. In his case, the people reporting were the Ministry of War, <clears throat> the Ministry of Interior, which was the domestic issues, and the Ministry of Finance. <clears throat> so they each submitted biweekly status reports. One thing Napoleon was against was status meetings. He wasn't a big fan of status meetings because he said, why do we need everybody to come into a meeting and say what the status is? They can send that to me in a report. He preferred we meetings to be for operational meetings where you actually do things. 
<clears throat> so you had weekly operational meetings where they would review needs or make decisions and things like that. The other NEPTA reports, status reports could come in through a report. Um, didn't need a, a, a status meeting, whether stand up or otherwise, there was no need. Um, he had a finance dashboard. As I mentioned, in his case, it was the price of wheat per department. He asked for the min, max, and average. Uh, basically, he asked for a spreadsheet. They didn't have Excel, but he asked them to you know, make up a graph of the min, max, and the average the price of wheat per, depart per department. And that's how he assessed whether his financial reforms were, were working. And he had other dashboards for different uh, you know, areas he was trying to improve. But he always looked at like one or two indices. So I love that. I, I love that because that is finding the killer metric, right? Yeah. Like there are so, f I you mentioned it earlier, but I feel like it bears repeating. There are so many reports and we've done, you know, as a former database administrator, et cetera, lots of IT projects. You've been through lots of IT projects too. There are so many times when people want these reports and we have to really ask them and drill into what are you going to use it for? How are you going to make decisions based on this data? Because you don't often need, it just mucks things up, <laughs> too many pieces of data. So it's a, to me, this is a really cool example. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. And I've had clients where they, want, they insisted on having 15 to 20 metrics or, or KPIs to look at for their projects. And, I, I try to encourage them to narrow it down to five at most, uh, really, to be able to make decisions and what are the most important things to look at. Otherwise, it tends to not get used. Correct. Yeah, beautiful. But, yeah. And he had monthly fund allocation meetings, which today we might call portfolio review meetings, uh, where he would, again, insist the subject matter experts, finance were in attendance. They would review the business cases. They would look at alternate scenarios and alternate options, and they would make their decisions. And that was a, a monthly fund allocation meeting. Uh, he also looked at deliverables and assets, and he believed they all have value and cost and benefit. So he was always insistent upon deliverables and assets being tied to value and what value they brought to the table. Uh, and some assets, he said, have negative value. He said, to beautify Paris, there's more to be demolished than to be built, which was true. They ended up uh, really beautifying the city by uh, demolishing a lot of areas and building monuments and so on. Uh, but and, you know, think about that in the organization, how much, like if you're a software company or if you're a company that has, a, you know, that's using software, which is pretty much every company, uh, is there software out there that's a, a sinkhole of, of effort to, to maintain it that's costing you more than it's benefiting you? Uh, he focused on three key areas. What was the work accomplished for the money that's spent? He didn't look at plan versus actual. He said, you could you could plan to spend a certain amount and the actuals could be right on target and you could still not be delivering the value that you expected to deliver. Uh, so he looked at the work accomplished for the money spent and the cost and time to achieve the remaining work and what value is still being delivered. Now, if that sounds a lot for those uh, project management mavens out there, if it sounds like earned value, it was. It was just 200 years earlier. And so really, he was using something akin to what today we would call the earned value method. Uh, but it, Napoleon felt it was all about the value and the product being delivered and what's left to do. Those are the things he focused on relentlessly. So if Napoleon ruled project land, he would encourage a relentless focus on value. Uh, his time management system. Um, again, we know a lot about that. He would uh, check and sort his mail in the morning. Now, he wouldn't read the mail. He would just sort it. He would say, this is current, pending, this was already answered, or the trash he would just throw on the floor. As Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king. <laughs> he would just throw it on the floor and let somebody else take it. Um, now, I read one article, uh, it was actually in a book, it was talking about his methods, uh, that was saying he, in many cases, he left, mail, he, he instructed his people to let the mail sit for three weeks, because he said, if it's three weeks later, it's still important, and it's really important. <laughs> if, if it's that important, somebody will, will get to me, and which is another thing. He really was relentless about not wasting time on unimportant things. Um, again, issues, he would review and categorize them as whether it's urgent or something he could delegate to somebody or irrelevant. Those were the only categories he had. Uh, now, again, he wouldn't 
actually review these things. He would just sort them. And then in the afternoon, he would take the actions and or delegate based on what he needed to work on. But uh, he would just organize everything in the morning. Uh, and then he would also reserve the morning for what he called uh, the the, uh, the grand leve, which we today we would call doctor's in session. He would have private weekly sessions by appointment. Uh, and he would have monthly public sessions to keep everybody aware of what was going on. Now, I have this getting things done picture here because this is probably the closest to uh, what Napoleon uh, used as his method. And it's a very effective method, still you know, popular today by David Allen, a definitely recommended book on time management. Um, and in the afternoon, he would reserve for reviewing his status reports, again, taking actions or delegating, and any weekly or monthly meetings he would reserve for the afternoon. So he had a system, and it worked. So if Napoleon ruled Project Land, he'd stay visible with one-on-one -on -one in town meetings to address questions, and he would encourage other managers to do the same. So third question, what about strategic leadership? What about the dynamic between project management and strategic leadership? So we're going to take a quick look at a case study, uh, perhaps his greatest battle, the Battle of Ulm, which was not covered in the movie, by the way. Uh, they, they covered the Battle of Austerlitz, which followed up this battle, but that's a different story. Uh, at any rate, we're going to look at the world's largest virtual team, which was Napoleon's Grand Army, and take a look at how you could have situational awareness. And the fact is, is it, it, is it something that's inherent or can it be learned? What the French called coup d'oeil, which was meant strike of the eye, but it meant situational awareness. And Napoleon talked a lot about that, about you know whether it was something that was innate or you could learn it. So the great campaign of uh, the first one of Ulm, I'll try to set the stage for you here. Uh, there are three players in this. Napoleon was here in the north of France in Boulogne, and he was about to launch an invasion of England because he got wind that England was going to invade France. So preemptively said they're never going to expect us to cross the channel. He had 200,000, all of his troops he had at this corner here, ready to invade England. But because he was well-connected, he also got wind that the Austrians over here in the middle were coming to invade France while he was tied up uh, via Bavaria. Uh, the Russians were over here, and they were going to come and help the Austrians. So if we look back here, Napoleon ended up taking his men, he took all 200,000 men. He didn't split them. He didn't say, well, we're going to keep 100,000 here and send 100,000. He said, this is now the most important thing because it's not like England's expecting us. They're not going to be disappointed if we don't show up. So we're going to take everybody and we're going to send them across France. Now, here's where his advantages came in with the light artillery and the canning and all that stuff. They traveled 375 miles. That's 15 miles a day, seven columns across a 100-mile front. Now, imagine that seven columns, you, you figured they're at least, you know, at least 10, over 10 miles apart. Now, imagine you're in a column of a military column, and you need to know what the next column is doing, and they're 10 miles apart. You don't have a cell phone. You can't see them 10 miles away. You're lost. You have no idea what they're doing. So how do you keep seven columns in sync? Now, here's what happened also. The Austrians... Uh, changed direction and decided to go south into a town called Ulm. Now, Napoleon, because, again, he was well-connected, he heard that. So he had to shift everybody. Now, how do you shift everybody when they're all 10 miles apart? And so that's where I started getting, you know, today we have cell phones and telephones. We, st we still find ways to not communicate. So what he had is, the first thing is, his troops were very well-trained. He insisted on training. They were well-dressed. I don't mean they were wearing tuxedos. I mean, they had good shoes, which was unheard of at the time. <laughs> he insisted on being well-dressed. They had the lighter artillery that we mentioned. They had canned foods or traveled with them in supply lines. He had something called the Imperial General Staff. And his Imperial General Staff is like a Pony Express. They would go to each of the columns, let them know what's happening, what the current plans are, and they would ask if they need anything, if they have any needs, and they would provide them for it. And that's how they kept everybody in sync. And that's how they knew that they had to change course. And so they're well connected. Again, that, that was a unique thing at the time. Um, again, he was well informed and they were self-contained. So each column <clears throat> had their own engineers. So if they encountered a place where a bridge needed to be built, they could build it on the fly. So they had their own medical staff and everything. So they each were self-contained. So it allowed them to operate in a way that no army had operated before. So they traveled and they ended up traveling so fast and being able to readjust 
that they surprised the Austrians and came from behind. They came from the West. So not only were they not expecting Napoleon, they certainly weren't expecting him to come from the West. <laughs> so uh, that battle was over before it started. It was barely fought. That was when they went on to the move to the Battle of Austerlitz. Uh, now, you might say, where were the Russians in all this? Well, it just so happened the Russians were still using the Julian calendar and the Austrians were using the Gregorian calendar. And so the Russians thought they were supposed to be there tomorrow. <laughs> so, so they were late. So that's when Napoleon said, hey, let's take advantage of this and let's finish this. And that's when he moved on to the Battle, Battle of Austerlitz, which is in the movie. And they talk about that. And he used to a lot of ingenious techniques there too. But that's another story, another case for a longer session. Uh, so I would say Napoleon's greatest asset was his ability to adapt to change. Now, what can we learn from this? Uh, lesson one is keep your thumb on the pulse of your version of Project Land. So whatever that means, he was well connected. He knew when to make changes. Uh, if that means, you know, getting in front of your customer, getting in front of the market, uh, you know, the vendors, just keep your thumb on the pulse of what's happening so you can make changes and make sure that what you're doing is going to be successful. And equip your team for success. Make sure they have the right tools and the right training um, and establish a good system of communication uh, when things are aren't you know, go, are going right or going wrong or things like that to le keep everybody up to date on what's happening. Make sure people have access to the same information. So, if Napoleon ruled Project Land, he'd invest in training, tools, and communication, and he would make sure everybody is clear on the top priorities as things change. And, uh, Dawn, you had uh, something to uh, to say about that too, about you know, making sure that as priorities change, everybody's up to date on things. Oh yeah, the the one of the examples I give in our training is around. 2020. So I don't know about you, but on January 20, on January 1st, 2020, I was like, this is my year. I'm going to Scotland. Somebody from uh, uh, in our crew here is from Scotland, actually. So hello, Scotland. I was going to Scotland. I was going to all I had lots of plans for 2020 to be my year. And then we all know what happens. Things changed big time for everyone. And the organizations that had the tools and communication processes in place for communicating the priorities of that organization as things changed were in much better shape to pivot when the world just completely surprised us all. And, um, and so this is where I feel like the benefit really became clear to those organizations that did have it. And the chaos became really clear to those organizations that did not have it. So that's just a really recent example. Um, just like you had to pivot in your personal life, likely like I did. Um, my dad got stuck with me in Florida. It was a total mess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? um, the organizations need to be able to pivot Two, and be able to communicate much more widely and broadly about what are the priorities now. And so I really, really love this. And I also love it that he invested in shoes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's, that, that makes sense. So let's um, keep going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the fourth thing, what principles can we learn from Napoleon? Now, now Napoleon had hundreds of maxims. They're all well-documented. They're in his own words. So I've assembled a handful here, and then there's more in your handout. Now, I, no, I realize we're running a little over because we started late because of the technical problem. So we'll try to zip through some of this, and then it'll all be in the recording as well. Uh, so if you can st stick with us for a few more minutes, uh, we're, we're getting closer towards the end. <laughs> so uh, Napoleon said, get your principles straight. The rest is a matter of detail. And I happen to have these particular books uh, from the 1800s along with many others that I do for research. But uh, I've assembled a few here. First, know when to plan and when to act. Napoleon said to su succeed sometimes, uh, one must sometimes be very bold and sometimes very prudent. So, uh, and, and Dawn, that reminds me of uh, our mutual uh, comrade, uh, Ralph, that talked about the racing analogy, where in order to go fast, you have to know when to go slow and in projects at times often in the beginning. Uh, take a phased approach. It's better to have a canal 10, le 10 leagues long every 10 years 
than to wait a century for a 100-league canal to be completed. So he always talked about operating in phases. Same thing when he was building a wing on the Louvre. He said, build one wing at a time so we don't have, uh, if we have to, to abandon it, we're not left with uh, four walls waiting for a ceiling and so on. I feel like Napoleon would have been a fan of Agile. He definitely would have. He would have been a, a fan of Agile, for sure. Um, this was advice Napoleon gave to his nephew. So I interpret this as be the silent type, but don't be afraid to ask questions. He said, especially for newbies, which his nephew was, uh, he used to always encourage him with various lessons. But one of the things he said is, know how to listen and understand that silence often produces the same effect as knowledge. So often you see somebody silent in a meeting, you think, hey, maybe they're brilliant. Uh, he says, but don't blush to ask questions. And a lot of newbies have that issue, whereas they're afraid to ask questions. And so, yes, you know, be silent unless you really have something to say or you really understand what's going on. But don't be afraid to ask questions because it'll make you look intelligent. Not, the, not the, Like the old uh, saying is, uh, I think as uh, Confucius said, uh, better to ask and be a fool for five minutes than not ask and be a fool forever. <laughs> so I think it holds true. Engage your experts and your staff. Napoleon said, think over carefully the great enterprise you're about to carry out. This was his message, his order to a uh, one of his marshals. And let me know before I sign your final orders your own views as to the best way of carrying it out. Now, again, it's, it's engaging. Uh, you know, he knows the people that are closest to the action, knows what's happening, and uh, it gets their input before just you know giving orders. Yeah, and that one I really love too because I find that a lot of leaders really mean that, what he said, which is yeah. my idea is go left, but y'all yeah. are here and I really want to know what you think, so please speak up if you have a different idea. And a exactly. lot of things, all of that commentary of please speak up if you have a different idea goes unsaid because they imagine you will speak up. They expect you to speak up and people don't. They think that someone and in a leadership role is being a dictator when really the subtext is please speak up. Otherwise, we're going this way because somebody's got to make a decision, especially in project land when the clock is always ticking. Yeah. So. And, and some cultures uh, have that issue too, where they don't, uh, if they're asked directly, they'll answer, but they don't tend to speak up unless they're in groups <laughs> and, and then where the group uh, speaks up. So it's, it's interesting. It's a cultural thing too. Yeah. So it's best to know that about your organization. And if you're the leader in of a project to create a culture that makes it clear that you want the ideas, you welcome hearing about risks, you welcome hearing opinions, and you will really take them into account. And that last quote too, final thought for me on it, at least sure. the way that I, the movie depicts Napoleon is that he isn't inclusive and wonderful and thoughtful, right? There, There's a lot of the sort of character that's being built there. But that last quote really makes me believe that he he did care about people and he did not think he was necessarily the best dictator on earth alone without input. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and while I enjoyed the film, it did take some poetic uh, license for sure. And it didn't quite get the character right. And there were a lot of things they attributed to Josephine, which she had nothing to do with in real life. <laughs> and then they had him firing a cannon into the uh, pyramids, which also never happened. So uh, go take it with a grain of salt. Uh, don't expect exact historical accuracy. It was accurate in the way that Gladiator was, which was not very much at all, but it was an entertaining movie. And <laughs> you'll see snippets of Napoleon's greatest hits, so, so to speak. <laughs> so um, be clear about setting the who's setting the goals. Uh, Napoleon said it's better to have one bad general than two good ones because uh, he had been burnt in one of his early battles by somebody that didn't want to do something that was necessary and Napoleon went in and did it and got recognized for it and when he was asked in a much later time to have uh, another general work with him he says if I'm going to do it I'm, I'm, you have to you know, leave me to make the decisions. Uh, give people a sense of purpose. Napoleon said the moral is to the physical as three is to one. He knew that people would really go the extra mile for something they believed in. So really articulating the why of any project is critical and understanding the goals. Uh, create the future and stay positive. Uh, it's a famous quote from Napoleon, a leader is a dealer in a hope. Uh, the whole quote is, uh, he said, the only way to lead people is to show them a future. A leader is a dealer in hope.
And I think that's true even for projects. So you think we're making Napoleon out to sound like the best thing since sliced bread. So you think, well, what went wrong? You know, <laughs> if you did all these things right, you know, you know, how could he have fallen from such heights? So uh, this takes us to how can we avoid his negative traits? So I'm going to go through this really quickly. We're going to see the uh, what, what was known as the Spanish ulcer and then Russia and then Waterloo. We're not going to take a deep dive into any of these, but just a quick uh, example. Uh, you know, just a reminder that Napoleon's at, at the height of his power, he was either allied or in charge of most of all Western Europe. Um, so what happened was uh, around 1808 in Spain, they came to him, Charles IV and Ferdinand VII, who was father and son, they were both arguing over who should be king, and they were both hated by the people. And they came to Napoleon when he saw what they were like, he said, well, this is ridiculous, neither one of them could, you know, should be king. And, and they were, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, within Napoleon's empire, they were, they were allies. So he had his brother Joseph, who is by all accounts a very decent man, uh, it temporarily instilled as, uh, as a king. And what happened was uh, the people themselves, especially in, in the Navarro region, didn't want democracy. Uh, they really didn't want it. Uh, they were very pious people. They hated the uh, Charles and his son, but they didn't want somebody from the outside taking over. So as good as Joseph was, uh, they, they revolted. So Napoleon sent his greatest marshal, Marat, to calm the revolt. Now, here's a case, a classic case of taking somebody who's a good doer and putting them into a strategic or leadership position. And uh, as, as Tom Peters once said, you don't take the first violinist in an orchestra and say, hey, let's make him conductor. Uh, he's so good at violin, we'll make him the conductor. It's a different skill. So Marat, um, his way of calming the revolt was firing into the crowd, and that launched a big revolt, which was immortalized in Goya's uh, painting uh, Dos de Mayo, the 2nd of May, when that happened. And now why is there a liberty bell next to Joseph? Because Joseph was eventually deposed from Spain and exiled. Uh, where did he end up? Philadelphia, where they have the Joseph Bonaparte house. Uh, he lived there for a couple of years and then moved to New Jersey. Um, now, lessons from this is understand the terrain, go and see for yourself. Don't just take at face value what you think people want. Um, and uh, there's even a slogan, a Japanese slogan within the Japanese lean manufacturing movement that originated with uh, the Toyota and, and uh, immortalized in the book, The Toyota Way. Uh, Genshi Genbutsu, which means go and see for yourself. And uh, Honda has another one uh, called Sangen Shugi, which means the three actuals, the, the actual place, the actual parts, the actual customer. So again, don't just uh, you know, take things at face value or look at the uh, instructions on a page or, or data. Uh, go and see for yourself what's happening. And also, don't assume you can make people embrace something they don't want to. First, understand their world. And I think that's important in projects. So often we're given a project to do, we're implementing something, we might listen to one person, but we haven't really gone and seeing what's happening. Uh, I think it was Henry Ford who said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So if Napoleon ruled Project Land, he would develop a robust change management plan and he would engage stakeholders. Uh, he wouldn't want another Spanish ulcer. Napoleon himself said, the greatest mistake in my career was the interference in Spanish affairs and all my defeats came from this source. And he was right because while he was mired in Spain, you had Charles, uh, King George III in England and Alexander the Tsar in Russia colluding to invade France while he was tied up in Spain. Uh, by the way, there was a movie called The Madness of King George III that in America it was called The Madness of King George because they're afraid people wouldn't see it because they didn't see one and two. <laughs> so it tells you something about Americans. But uh, at any rate, uh, he was mired in Spain and it caused a problem. So Napoleon had no choice, but to, he, he wrote letters to the Tsar, but they weren't answered. Many believe that uh, the nobles around him, particularly his mother, uh, threw the letters out and he never got them. So at any rate, he had no choice but to invade Russia, but he assembled the largest coalition in history, 600,000 men of all different countries, basically all of Western Europe was going in to invade, and plus Poland was going in to invade Russia. It wasn't just him. Um, and it took a lot of diplomacy, as I mentioned. He examined the weather trends for the last 20 years because he knew that the weather could be really tricky going in there. And, and uh, years before, Sweden had run into the same problem. Uh, he had contingency plans and decision gates for, okay, here's what's going to happen if we get here and there's an issue. The Russians were known to have a scorched earth policy where they burn their own land and retreat. He knew that. So he had certain contingency plans. 
He studied past campaigns. He he gave the troops four day food rations because he said you're going to need it uh, if they're going to burn their own land and retreat. Again, he had his supply lines with canned food just in case. And the whole time he was engaging in a peace campaign with the czar, letters that were probably never received. And this was a famous map from uh, that uh, Edward Tufte, the world's leading guru on information presentation, said it's one of the best maps ever because it shows the width of the troops was like 600,000 people whittled down to 100,000 by the time he got to Moscow. And then he returned with about 40,000. And uh, you think, okay, well, what happened? And hardly a battle was fought. Uh, and it was mostly weather related. And this shows the temperatures and their impact on it. So what could possibly go wrong with this great plan? Well, what did go wrong it was the hottest winter, hotter than in 20, or hottest summer rather, hotter than in 20 years. And they had scorching heat and the Russians as expected did use a scorched earth policy and they burnt their lands and retreated. But not to worry, Napoleon had four days worth of food rations, but then the troops were undisciplined because they weren't all his troops. They were from all different walks of life and they ate all the food rations the first day. <laughs> so, that was a problem, um, but not to worry. He had all the supply lines with all the canned goods and stuff like that. But then they had heavy rains and the horses and supply lines got stuck in the mud so it couldn't keep up with the people. Uh, so there went the supply lines. So people were starving. Uh, by the time they got to Moscow, they were whittled down to 100,000 people. And what did Russians do? They burnt the city to the ground, their own city, which he couldn't believe, uh, and they evacuated. And here he was sitting in Moscow. But uh, at the time, you know, his marshals were saying, well, we should just cut our losses and get back. And he said, I, I swear, if he gets my letters, we, there has to be something we can work out. And at any rate, uh, at that point, they waited a little too long because winter came earlier than it had in 20 years. And the people weren't dressed for winter. And many of them died in the cold. And then there was a freak heat spell that all the ice melted in the river. <laughs> so they, in the Berezina River, a lot of troops and horses were lost. And it was just a, a comedy of errors of what happened. So um, a few lessons here. Make sure your team's committed, well-trained, and prepared for what may come. Develop a core team to make up for gaps in your own skills or vision and listen to collective opinions. And know when to reevaluate re the mission and make changes. You know, revisit your goals. Present the options to management with a recommendation. And um, I always refer to a book Ed Yorden wrote. He was the father of object-oriented programming, but he wrote a book called Death March about how to avoid leading your people into a death march, which he called basically any project where any of the major factors had less than a 50% chance of success. And it's a, generally a good guideline. So if Napoleon ruled Project Land, he would encourage project managers to use a core team and reassess troubled projects. So Napoleon was exiled to Elba, where for several years, where he uh, kind of, um, you know, had a rebirth there. But then Louis the Eighteenth. No, this is not Napoleon who gained a lot of weight. <laughs> this is Louis the Eighteenth, who took over France. He restored France back to a monarchy and got rid of all the reforms. And Napoleon couldn't take it anymore. And finally, he knew he could be successful, so he returned with uh, with I think two thousand men uh, on boats from Elba to France. And uh, in the movie, he returned because of Josephine's uh, improprieties or whatever, but that's not really true. He returned <laughs> because of, he needed to save his country. Uh, so he returned, and the soldiers from Louis the Eighteenth were sent to arrest him. And that part of the movie is true. Uh, instead, they embraced him and returned with him, and Napoleon was back. So now we had the new, improved, and tired Napoleon, a period called the Hundred Days, when he was back for a hundred days before his final exile. And Napoleon said, a great many foolish things have been done, but I'm prepared to put everything right. And I always like this Turkish proverb, uh, no matter how far you've gone on a wrong road, turn back. And someone from Turkey is here as well. Oh, good. <laughs> That's great. We're represented. Yes. Um, so w Waterloo, I'm not going to get into a whole case study on this, uh, other than to say uh, it was the inevitable result, result of burnout. Uh, his troops were tired of fighting, especially his key marshals, um, his uh, his chief, uh, uh, the Imperial uh, General Staff officer was uh, killed. Some say, say it was suicide. He jumped out a window. Others say he was pushed. But at any rate, he wasn't there anymore. Uh, and a lot of his key marshals weren't there. So he was working with the second string. 
uh, and people were just burnt out. And a reminder here, project land is all about people. So if you're operating from the beginning with people are burnt out, um, now there was fatigue. He lost his key man, as I mentioned. There were heavy rains. The old Napoleon in better shape, but by this point he was he was in ill health. Uh, he had stomach cancer. Um, he didn't know it at the time. But at any rate, there were heavy rains. There were some delays. But the biggest problem with Waterloo is the British and, and Dutch and Belgian troops uh, assembled at Waterloo. Napoleon could have taken them. He had beaten uh, Wellington before, which they don't talk about in the movie, and he knew he could beat him again. But the big thing is the Prussians were coming from the other side, and he sent Marshal Grouchy, uh, who was not very good, um, to delay the Prussians, and instead, uh, Grouchy ignored the Prussians for some reason. Many speculate that he intentionally withheld his troops. Uh, and eventually, Marshal Grouchy was exiled where? To Philadelphia. <laughs> so, once again, everybody's exiled to Philadelphia. That became Philadelphia became a, a hot spot for uh, the uh, Bonapartists uh, that were exiled for some reason. But at any rate, uh, the, uh, the Duke of Wellington said it was a damn near run thing, meaning they almost lost it, but then the Prussians arrived at the last minute and saved the day. Um, so Napoleon's final exile was on St. Helena, a remote island off the coast of Africa in the, in the South Atlantic Ocean. It was more like a rock, and where he uh, compiled his lessons learned sessions. And I like to imagine he was saying, all things considered, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. And uh, so there he compiled the books that we uh, know today. So I'll close with this quote from Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so there are things that we can, uh, we can certainly learn from that. Uh, as Dawn mentioned, there's a free handout. I've assembled uh, Napoleon's quotes by categories. I'm not gonna read them all here, but, uh, you know, but all these categories of, of for project managers, uh, and I've assembled these quotes, and I think you'll find it, uh, hopefully you'll find it a valuable handout. And I believe it is in the chat session and uh yeah, so in the week. comments check out the link that uh ricardo or i will be dropping momentarily to get uh the handout which is the curated uh, document of quotes uh by napoleon and we added a little bit of information about the uh about the book that jerry wrote the Napoleon, uh, with na the Napoleon leadership lessons that are great for project people. So um, please check that out. And all you have to do is hit the link and then we will, it will immediately send you to how to get the handout right now. So go ahead and do that. Great. And for those viewing the recording, is there a way that they should they email and uh, we can send them the link? Actually, they can also hit the link. So the link is oh. project to guruacademy.com slash Napoleon in Project Land. That's projectguruacademy.com slash Napoleon in Project Land. And we'll keep that up for quite some time. So check it out and see if you can't still get the, the document emailed to you. Um, many thanks to our our behind the scenes creative artist, Beth, who, who made it beautiful. So what Jerry and I created was kind of terrible. And she was like, I'm inspired. And she made it. Oh, she, yeah, she did an amazing yeah. job on that. Yeah, I thought so too. So I hope you really like the handout. And if so, let us know, um, because we like to pass that along to Beth that her efforts were appreciated. So with that, I'd like to ask if there are any final questions. Thanks so much for those of you who are able to hang on with us from Mexico and Turkey and Minnesota and Pennsylvania. We had some Philadelphia folks in the room. We had Central PA in the house as well. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. We really, really appreciate you being here in Project Land with us. And we hope that you learned something today that you can take back immediately to your version of Project Land. Please stay tuned, follow us. If you like this, it takes a lot to put these on. Um, please connect with us and let us know what you thought about it. Drop a comment, uh, send us an invite to connect with you. Follow us on Instagram even, um, where we put a little extra personal touch on things on Instagram. Um, we're also on Twitter and Facebook, but would love to connect with you and stay connected and support your journey through Project Land and your careers, especially if you're 
considering yourselves project people, whether project manager, project sponsor, steering team member, executive, et cetera. So love, love, love having you here. Thank you so much, Jerry. For Thanks, Don. It was great, great to be here. Every time you speak, even though we went through this together a few times, I <laughs> learn more and things hit me differently. So I'll even be watching this again myself as I continue to learn and try to get this history <laughs> in there. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it's like drinking from a fire hose for, for sure. It is and worth an extra watch. So the recording will be available soon. Stay tuned, everybody. And thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day conquering Project Land. And thanks again, Jerry, for being with us. Thank you, Don. Bye. Bye.